Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Bruce Montalvo Show, broadcasting from the always sunny and beautiful Southern California on L.A. Talk Radio and AM 1050, KCAA, NBC News Radio. It's Sunday, December 9th, 2012, and on today's broadcast, I am honored to speak to Kathy Etchingham, ladies and gentlemen, who is re-releasing her book, Through Gypsy Eyes. She was, of course, Jimi Hendrix's longest-term girlfriend, Jimi Hendrix being probably the greatest, if not the greatest, electric guitarist in the history of, of all time. Now, uh, he was able to break through into the mainstream uh, into mainstream America of the 1960s due to his immense talent in a time when racial oppression and the Vietnam War were prevalent and whose music still today is still essential to anyone who picks up an electric guitar. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I would like to I would like you to please welcome our guest, the inspiration to The Wind Cries Mary and so many other of Jimmy's greatest hits. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Kathy Etchingham to our broadcast. Thank you, Kathy, for being a guest on our show today. You're welcome. Thank you. Now, you know, it's I know it's pretty early out there in Melbourne. It's it's pretty early, but thank you again for joining us today. Well, it's um it's about seven o'clock in the morning and it's a beautiful sunny day, just like California. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Now, Kathy, um, this uh, the the 27th of November. It would have marked uh, Jimmy's 70th birthday. Now, can you let our listening audience know how you successfully lobbied for an English Heritage Blue plaque, which was placed at 23 Brook Street in London, England, and really also enlighten our listeners as to the significance, the history behind that building. Well. Um, I wrote to English Heritage probably in the early 90s. I can't remember exactly what year, 1992 perhaps, suggesting that uh, a blue plaque should be erected in his honour. Um, it was an unusual request for them because um, most of the blue plaques go to members of the establishment or famous artists uh, from the past, scientists, people like that. And it was in the system for ooh, quite a while, uh, over a year, maybe 18 months. And I wrote to them again and said, you know, are you looking at it and everything. And eventually he got on the short list. I couldn't believe it. But it wasn't sort of cut and dried because he was only on the short list. Then eventually, um, after much protest by members of the establishment, um, they decided that they were going to give him one, that he did make a contribution to society, certainly in the area of music. And um, it went from there, and we were just bowled over. It was the most unusual thing. It hit the headlines and the newspapers and everything that they'd said yes to it. And um, the significance of it is that uh, there are lots of plaques for people, but English heritage ones are... Um, sort of the creme de la creme of, blue, of plaques and you have to have made a significant contribution to have been dead for more than 20 years uh, so he qualified and um, so it went ahead and um, there it is and, and it's, it's a tourist attraction and people go and see it and so buses tour buses go past it and it's um yeah, it's a great thing. It means that his name will never be forgotten because that will be there for centuries to come. Absolutely. And it's right next to um, George Frederick Handel's plaque who lived next door. Wow. So it was a big, it was quite a big thing. Excellent. Now, Kathy, since uh, the release of your book, uh, 1999, your book, uh, Through Gypsy Eyes, it's released rave reviews. Uh, one in particular from the Times, calling it uh, a tender memoir of years in the eye of the 60s hurricane. Now, the book's controversial style and fascinating uh, insight paints a, uh, a true picture of the swinging 60s. Now, can you give our listening audience an inside scoop into your book, Through Gypsy Eyes? Oh, well, 
it's quite difficult because it's, it's a book. Exactly. But it is. It's all about the 60s. It's about the people we knew and the people that I knew before I knew Jimmy. The nightclub scene that everybody knew everyone else. It was a much smaller sort of um, music scene in those days. Everybody knew everyone else. Uh, things are quite different now. And the book tries to go into some sort of uh, detail as to how that was, why it was. And it was an emerging music scene. And it's, you know, it, 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 it tries to explain all of that. It tries to explain, you know, how Jimmy arrived in England and what he didn't expect <laughs> and, and what happened. So it's... Um, it's it's all about that. Oh, Kathy. And s some of the things that happened after his death is in there. And yeah. gen generally, it it covers the 60s period as best I could. Okay. Now, it, it said you really didn't pull any punches in this publication. <clears throat> now, uh, Kathy, can you let our listening audience know about the first time you met Jimmy, the day he arrived in London, I believe September of 1966? Yeah. Well, I used to live in an apartment above Zoot Money and his uh, wife, and Chaz brought him round to the flat, to, to, to Zoot's flat, straight from the airport, because it was on the way from the airport to the centre of London. And Ronnie, which is Zoot's wife, came upstairs and said, oh, you must come down and see the, this guy that Chaz has brought back from America. He looks like the wild man of Borneo. <laughs> But I'd gone to bed late that night, and this was like 11 o'clock in the morning. And um, I said, oh, look, you know, uh, I don't, can't be bothered. And she said, well, we're all going to go down to the Scotch of St. James's later, so, you know, you can come down with us because he's going to be playing there. But it went in one ear and out of the other. I was, simply wasn't interested until they started making this terrible racket downstairs where they plugged in the guitars and somebody was on drums and I was right above them. But I still didn't go down. And um, then later on that evening, we all got ready and went off to the Scotch. And when we walked in, the whole place was standing quietly. I've never seen anything like it before. People were standing on the stairs and everything, listening. And... Um, when we got downstairs, because it was the entrance was on the first floor and the club was in the basement, and um, uh, when we got downstairs, Ronnie said, "Oh, you know, come over here." So we all went and sat with them. And uh, when Jimmy finished playing, because Chaz was very nervous because Jimmy didn't have a visa to perform, mm -hmm. and he only had a visitor's visa, and they were worried, you know. Yes. And um, that's, and then he came and sat back down again, and he was with Linda Keith at the time. But within, I don't know, 15 minutes, he'd moved his seat <laughs> next to mine, <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> we got talking, and, and then there was a bit of a fracker with Linda, and um, Chaz was terrified in case, you know, police were called and Jimmy was arrested or whatever and deported so he said well take take jimmy back to the hyde park towers hotel and uh so i we, we went out and we walked up to piccadilly where jimmy looked the, the wrong way nearly got run over by a taxi oh, wow. because he looked to his left instead of his right and uh i pulled him back by his coat and he just it just it, you know nearly touched his chest, the taxi. And um, anyway, eventually we got back to the Hyde Park Towers Hotel and all the rest of the people that we were with turned up later. And we all sat around sort of talking and what have you. And that's how we met. Wow. Now, Jimmy, so, Jimmy referred to you as his Yoko Ono. I also saw a publication that stated that. Your thoughts? Yeah. Yes, he did told a newspaper exactly. that I can't remember the exact words um, but something something along those lines yeah truly love at first sight between the two of you definitely sorry <laughs> I said it was truly love uh, at first sight <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> it must have been something like that. But we were, I mean, I was quite young. I was only 20 years old. So um, whether it was love, I don't know. But uh, certainly there was some sort of, you know, immediate attraction there. Exactly. Now, Kathy, uh, <laughs> Jimmy was good friends with uh, Eric Clapton, another legendary guitarist. Uh, can you uh, can you let us know if they ever played together? Did they ever jam together? Yes. Well, the first time they played together is we we went to um, well, I've forgotten which university it was, where Eric Clapton was playing, mm. and and I, I I remember we walked in. I was carrying Jimmy's guitar, and um, Chaz went up to the stage and Eric leaned down and he asked if um, Jimmy could you know, play with them, or, you know, and they, they all, uh, I think it was, um, I can't remember which one of them was sort of objected, one of them did, um, but eventually they said yes, and uh, Jimmy took the guitar, went on stage, Eric went round the back, and um, <laughs> he, I think the whole of the, uh, the it was like a, um, I don't know, was it like a ballroom or something? They all sort of stopped and thought, oh my goodness, you know, <laughs> Eric couldn't believe his <laughs> ears. And it was, I think it was just the one, I think he did Killing Floor, I can't remember, but um, it, uh, it that was the first time. Now, uh, Eric even said that the first time he, he heard Jimmy play, he contemplating quitting guitar altogether because Jimmy was just that good. <laughs> <Your> yeah. <thoughts. laughs> he, he wasn't very happy. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't very happy. He had a very stern look on his face. <laughs> he was smoking a cigarette really quickly. <laughs> I, could, I could imagine. Now, uh, you, you must have seen Jimmy perform hundreds of times. Uh, so, yeah. So many legendary performances. Uh, Kathy, can you let our, our listening audience know which performance resonates most, the one that's probably mo most memorable to you? Uh, I mean, there's so many to choose from. No, it, it's impossible to say because don't forget, I saw performances that nobody else saw, weren't recorded exactly. or anything. In the early days, going around the north of England, playing in clubs and things, yes. when he was ab absolutely perfect. You know, he wasn't quite so... Um, he wasn't such a perfectionist then. He didn't have a huge audience, so he could do as he pleased. And um, some of those performances were probably some of his best, but went unrecorded. Wow. Now, were, yeah. you, were you there at uh, Woodstock 1969? No. No? I didn't. No. What, I, I think that's probably my favorite performance. Of course, I wasn't yeah. alive, but when I, when I, as a guitar player myself, I, I see that performance and I'm just blown away by his interpretation of the star spangled banner it's I, uh, I know amazing <laughs> uh, he could play god save the queen as well <laughs> excellent. but that that went on recorded too <laughs> now kathy it's uh it's obvious that the the paparazzi of today they're much different than those of yesterday in, in your day kathy uh yeah can you uh can you let our listening audience know about the run-ins that you and jimmy had with the paparazzi and the fact that Jimmy also stated that he didn't really feel safe in New York City. No. No, I know that. Um, we didn't really have any run-ins with paparazzi because there weren't, there wasn't a sort of organized paparazzi in those days. So, I mean, one could walk around the streets without anybody taking any photographs or anything. Um, you could come and go. There was never anyone outside the apartments or anything like that taking photographs. I think in today's world, you wouldn't be able to walk around so freely as as you could then. Um, in fact, I know I know for a fact you couldn't. Uh, every move would be um, captured on camera. That wasn't the case then. Photographers didn't follow you around. Photographs were taken, but they they were usually sort of organised. You knew that there's going to be somebody there taking a photograph, taking photographs. But generally speaking, we went all over the place. We could walk around Oxford Street, which is a major shopping street in London, without anybody taking any photographs. 
or bothering us in any way. You occasionally had somebody come up and say, can I have your autograph? Um, but generally speaking, there aren't that many photographs around um, of him privately in the street or anything like that. Just a few. Oh. So that's the difference between then and now. Well, Kathy, uh, Jimmy was uh, was uh, an essential figure with due, due to his lyrics and in the civil rights movement. He gained a lot of attention, and unfortunately, it, it caused the, the Federal Bureau of Investigations to actually open up a file on him, I believe in 1969. Uh, there were also, I mean, tons of bogus charges thrown against him in, in this time. Can, can you let our listeners know about those bogus charges and the, the run-ins he had with Johnny Law, so to say? Well, I don't really know. that. I didn't know that the FBI had opened a file on him. I've only learned that since. I mean, it's something that I wouldn't... Well, I don't suppose he knew about it either. Um, and I think that it was like in England. The, the, the police were always out to, to get... Um, a celebrity because it sort of furthered their career and they got themselves in the papers. And I think that in those days uh, the police were not more corrupt than they are now and used to plant drugs on rock stars and then charge them with it. Exactly. And I think that happened more than once. Um, so I don't really know um, why they did that or why they opened a file on him because. He wasn't really radical in any way. I mean, his lyrics were his lyrics, but I mean, he wasn't a, a, an activist in any in any way whatsoever. Exactly. He might have made comments which they interpreted as being radical, but I knew Jimmy quite well, and sometimes he'd say things, but you know, his heart wasn't in it. <laughs> he was he wasn't an activist, okay. you know, or politically minded at all. Okay, well, I don't think so. Well, certainly when I was with him, it wasn't. He may, he may have changed in the last year of his life, but I don't think so. Okay. I, I haven't seen anything that he's said or, or... I think things have been attributed to him that he didn't actually say. Okay. Um, but I, ha- I haven't seen anything that sort of shows that he was in any way, you know, radicalized. Okay. Well, Kathy, since Jimmy's death, he... He died September 18, 1970. Uh, uh, you, you, you've asked. There's actually a lot of uh, editorials from 1991 to 1992 where you asked Scotland Yard to open up a new investigation to reinvestigate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. B- due to the the toxicology report, you gained considerable information regarding that report. Can you let our listening audience know about your? Uh, your attempt to open up a new investigation into Jimmy's death at, at that time? Well, I, I, having seen the document, I didn't think that a proper investigation had been done. Uh, there seemed to have been conflicting um, accounts of what happened, and in the years subsequent to his death, d- d- the, the person that was supposed to be there with him had made different statements, different to the ones that she'd made to the coroner. So I simply wrote to the Attorney General saying, here are all these interviews. <laughs> here is what she says here. Here is what's said there. Here is what's said the other. Would you consider reopening this, you know, uh, this case and try and find out exactly what did happen? Exactly. And um, having read the dossier and seen all the conflicting statements and what was actually said in the coroner's court, they decided that... Um, there was enough evidence there to reinvestigate it, and that's exactly what they did. So all the, uh, uh, most of the people that were down there refused to be interviewed by the police. Um, the FBI went to see some of the people that were in the United States, and they refused as well. Um, and they took a long statement from, from, the, from the woman that was with him at the time, um, and she had her lawyers there and everything, which they thought was quite unusual. And uh, that dossier is um, with Scotland Yard still. And so no one can actually see it because uh, it's, it's confidential. Um, 
but I, I have an idea, which I will be writing about in the future, of what the outcome of that investigation was. Absolutely. Now you stated. Yeah, but I, but I want I, I want to put it into writing so that it's more concise and. Abs- absolutely. Now, yeah. Kathy, you stated uh, to the alternative press in London in that publication. Uh, I read it from the El- Ellsberg Daily Record in 1993. Uh, you stated, "I don't think, I don't think it should have happened. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people." And yes, and I still think that. He also, it said he left a, a message to his manager stating, "I need help, bad man." Uh, and there's so so many other statements. His his bassist from uh, the Jimi Hendrix Experience stated, "Who takes nine downers and drinks a bottle of wine?" You know, in disbelief. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's that's what I will be writing about. The the, the tablets are very very powerful. Each tablet was a double dose of a barbiturate, I think it was, or some some kind of barbiturate, with, combined with an antihistamine. And the woman's statement, Monica Dannemann's statement, kept saying, I told, I told him these were very weak. These were very weak tablets. Well, they weren't. They were very powerful. So, in fact, he'd, he'd imbibed 18 times the normal dose. Wow. Yeah. Now, those tablets were only available in Germany, where she came from. They've never been available in the United States and never been available in the U.K., and both the UK and the United States never made double doses of anything, but the Germans did. They since stopped doing it um, for that very reason, and those tablets are no longer available because they were too dangerous. So um, those are her tablets in him. And uh, what was she doing with them? <laughs> the, what was she doing with those tablets? Exactly. The, now, those tablets, yeah. they were, I uh, believe they were uh, titled Vesterex. Is that correct? Vesperax. Vesperax. Okay. Yeah. But, but I also read that Jimmy may have been an insomniac. Uh, is, that, is there any relevance to that? Well, certainly wasn't what I knew. <laughs> 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 he, he slept quite well. <laughs> I don't know what happened in that last year, but it all seemed to spiral downhill. Um, I think he was mixing with the wrong people. Um, he got caught up in, I don't know, sort of a very strange set of people. He had lots of hangers-on and people that weren't good for him. And he wasn't having any relaxing times, you know. He couldn't sit in front of the television and just, just enjoy himself with, a, you know, a night in. Exactly. And he was out every night, and I think it just became too much for him, you know. Jimmy didn't like being alone. He liked company. Um, and so he didn't know these people. He didn't know this woman. He'd only met her on the Tuesday, and he was dead by the Friday morning. Wow. Although she she claimed that she'd known him since 1969, and there's a picture of her and him, but actually the picture's cropped down from a, a, a larger picture with all the fans. She was one of them in a group photograph in the lobby of a hotel in Germany. Yeah, and she'd cool. cropped it down to just the two of them to make it look as if it was a sort of an intimate photograph. So I've come to the conclusion that she was barking mad. <laughs> <laughs> and he fell into the hands of a <laughs> basically a stalker. Wow. That's that's my opinion. Now there are so many loose ends when you when you investigate uh, Jimmy's death. I mean, I I saw a statement in which you stated that it took them five hours to call an ambulance. I mean, that yeah. that's sketchy yeah. right off the bat. That is sketchy. Yeah. Well. I spoke to uh, some of the people that were down there. I spoke to them, and at that time it was before the police investigation, so they spoke more freely. And they all said that they got the call at the first light of dawn, you know? Mm -hmm. And at that time that was, I've forgotten now, 6.30 or or something like that, 7 o'clock. And um, they all went round there and cleaned the place up and what have you, and... And I said, well, what was Jimmy doing? And they said, 
Well, he was on the bed, but I couldn't look. And the, the, the phone call to the ambulance came, went in at uh, 18 minutes past 11. So all that was going on beforehand. And he was definitely dead um, when he was taken from the hotel room. Because very recently, one of the senators here, Bob Brown, Senator Bob Brown, who's just recently retired, about three months ago at a press club um, meeting, the journalist asked him, because he was one of the doctors that received Jimmy that morning, asked him, you know, about Jimi Hendrix, and he said, I've told you before, he'd been dead for hours before he was brought in. Wow. So there's another mistake, because the ambulance attendants shouldn't have taken him. They should have called the police. But they took him to the hospital, but he was already dead. Wow. So all these mistakes were made, yeah? Right. And the autopsy was very brief and uh, didn't... didn't uh, I mean, he was taken in on Friday, but they didn't do the autopsy until the following Monday, so there was no indication of how long he'd been dead. All you've got is the doctors. All of the doctors have been identified, and they all say he was dead. Well, and yeah, um, I saw and that when they put him on a monitor, it was yes. just flatlining. Wow. And that his uh, trachea and his lungs were full of wine. Kathy, I, I also, I, I took a look at the toxicology report, or, the, or at least some reports of it, and mm. they state that there was only 20 milligrams of blood in, uh, of alcohol in his, in his, in his system. Mm -hmm. uh, that's basically, I mean, he, he wasn't drunk, if you, if you do the math, 20 milligrams. No, <laughs> no, no, he wasn't, but uh, <clears throat> I can't explain that. All I can think of is that, excuse me, I've got a bit of hay fever. Um, all I can think is that he probably hadn't drank that much, but he, went, he, he was drinking when he went unconscious. Wow. That's what I think, that possibly, and that it went down the wrong way mm -hmm. into his lungs. Um, that's the only thing I can think of. And it's just so strange because he was also found fully clothed, you know. And they, yeah, it's it's just, there's just so many strange anomalies in this case. I mean, yeah, he was fully dressed, so he wasn't in bed, obviously. So whatever happened that morning, we'll we'll never really know because the person that he was with um, committed suicide. So, you know, and took took whatever happened that morning with her. Uh, you, you can only piece together bits and pieces of it. All I really know is whatever was going on down there, as Charles Chandler said, it was a conspiracy of negligence. Wow. Now, yeah? They were looking after their own... Their own know. interests. Hmm? They were looking after their own interests. That's right. Uh, Kathy, it's said that uh, Jimmy's manager, Michael Jeffrey probably had the most to gain from Jimmy's untimely death, and apparently he even com confessed to, uh, I believe it was a roadie from the animals. Uh, Jeffrey has since been dead since uh, 1973. Yeah. But uh, he, he, he confessed to, uh, to basically taking part in maybe the, Jimmy and, and the murder of Jimmy. Yeah, well, tell me how how he managed to do it. <laughs> he, you know, it, <laughs> he did own the rights to uh, Voodoo Child, Purple Haze. So I mean, it, I, in fact, we'll probably never know. But that that there is a a lot a lot of blame that is placed that is at his doorstep. Possibly, do you? What are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, he's dead, isn't he? He can't defend himself. Yes. You can say anything you like. He said anything. But when the police investigation was going on, it was all over the newspapers, all over the world. Anybody that had that kind of information had a civic duty to step forward and tell the police what they knew. They didn't. Wow. Now, See? Kathy... Uh, so that's my, my, those are my thoughts on it, you know? <laughs> okay. Kathy, if, if that was the case... Yes. You wouldn't keep something like that to yourself. Wow. 
Uh, and, 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 and it's a bit short on detail, isn't it? Yes. How did he do it? Those no? are definitely the <laughs> speculations that, that have arisen over the years since since Jimmy's death. Now, uh, can there? I heard there is a there's a, a film being in the process, a, a Jimi Hendrix film. Uh, can you, yes, I, I've heard that too. Uh, what what what's the scoop on that? Do do you know anything? I, I don't know. It's nothing to do with me. <laughs> nobody's out, nobody's asked me about it. Okay. So. <laughs> I can only imagine it's some sort of drama that it's not actually a biopic because if it was a biopic, sh- surely you would want the help of the people that were actually there, especially over costumes and things. Exactly. Um, but they didn't. So I, I assume it's <laughs> by being produced by Cheapskate Productions. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who they are or what they are or what they're doing. Okay. It's um, it's all it's all very secret, isn't it? It it is. Uh, they they don't want to let the 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 people know right away their plans, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope it's not going to be a terrible embarrassment for me. That's <laughs> that's the thing with these pictures, you know. They they, you know, we hope to have some type of say in them, you know. And you know, when they come out, I, I would hope they would go to you. I mean, you were his his longtime girlfriend, his. Is Yoko Ono basically, and they I, here I'm hearing that they didn't even you know extend you a, a call or let no nope. get any nope. c- conjecture on on your thoughts. You know, I don't, no, I don't no, know. they're going to portray me without knowing me. They reckon that they've got it all from newspaper articles, <laughs> no archives. That's that's not good at all. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um. Obviously, it's not. It can't be. It, it can't be serious. I mean, it can't be a serious biopic. Well, Kathy, I would like to ask you what you. I mean, the tragic demise of Jimmy. He's he's so respected. He's the greatest electric guitarist in in my opinion to to ever live. I mean, you you want people to to focus on on the charismatic, on the, the, the happy figure that, that he was, that he represented in, in your life and in so many other people's lives. Can, can you let our listening audience know just exactly how you would like the people to remember Jimmy? I would like people to remember Jimmy as a guitar genius and a really nice guy. He was just an ordinary, really nice guy whose company anybody would want to be in. He was funny, he was amusing, he was generous, and he was well-mannered. Um, people don't know that, but Jimmy used to open the door for me, he used to light my cigarette for me, pour my drink for me. <laughs> mm-hmm. The only thing he didn't do is make my tea for me, because he, he never mastered how to do that. <laughs> um, so I would like him to be remembered as a really, you know, nice guy who brought great pleasure to the world through his enormous talent. Absolutely. That's how I'd like him to be remembered. Okay. Not as some drug-crazed lunatic, which he wasn't, you know? People have, people have written to me on my Facebook saying he was a drug addict. No, he wasn't. Exactly. So, Hello? Yes, I'm here. Are you there? I'm listening. Um, he wasn't a drug addict. It's, it's as simple as that. I mean, I don't know what happened in the days leading up to, or months leading up to his death. But certainly when I knew him, he wasn't. And we never had anything like that in the house. Yeah. You know, it was really just down to a few, you know, a few joints. <laughs> And, that's, and we didn't have anything harder than that. And that's never harmed anybody to this day, unless no, they, no, it just made they just made it legal, haven't they? In Washington, <laughs> is it in Washington? Yes, I believe Washington and Colorado. Yes. Well, there you go. And um, it was made legal in the UK, oh, a long time ago, for personal use, small amounts of personal use. And that's all, you know, that's all that was ever there. Um, but in those days, of course, to have a small amount of cannabis or something like that was a terrible crime that you could go to jail for. So everyone was very careful. <laughs> uh, Jimmy did get booked a couple of times. That's what I was referring to earlier. He uh, and they even, I, I believe it's it's even rumored that one of his managers even might have planted him 
planted the drugs on him. <laughs> uh, why would they do that? Well, they uh, you it wasn't you didn't uh, see that information where he was caught up with uh, I believe a small amount of cannabis or something of that sort. Not in England. Okay. No, the only time I know that, that there was some trouble was in America when he somebody put something in his bag and he was he was going to Canada. Uh, I think he was going to Canada and then they found the drug in his bag that some fan had put in there. But but in England, no. The only time we had a narrow escape was um, we lived in Ringo Starr's flat in uh, Montague Square, mm -hmm. and we left, found another flat uh, around the corner, just that's down the road. We left, and John Lennon and Yoko Ono moved in. And shortly afterwards, the police raided it and busted John Lennon. <laughs> and I think that they thought they were going to get Jimi Hendrix, <laughs> but we'd already gone. <laughs> And so John Lennon got busted instead. Wow. Amazing <laughs> stories. Well, Kathy, Sorry? Um, an amazing story indeed. Well, Kathy, uh, can you let our listening audience know where they can find your book, Through Gypsy Eyes? Well, it's available on Kindle, and you can download it to your iPhone or your computer, as well as if you've got a uh, Kindle device. And if you go to my Facebook, Kathy Etchingham's Facebook, uh, there's a link through to my website, and you just press on the, the cover, and it takes you through to Kindle. And you can download it onto your computer if you haven't got a Kindle, or your iPhone. That's how you get it. Excellent. Well, Kathy, i, I got to let you know before we leave, I, I was exposed to Jimmy when I was uh, about 14 years old. I was going through my father's old, uh, old records, and I found Midnight Lightning. You remember that one? Yeah, do. Oh my, that is my favorite record. Uh, Midnight Lightning. Also, uh, uh, not many songs that that are, you know are are known about. I Isabella. Uh, yes, Isabella. Yeah. Uh, of course, Voodoo Child. So yep. many epic hits from a legendary rock virtuoso. Thank yes. you, thank you, Kathy, so much for for being on on my broadcast today. Thank you, and I know it's early out in Melbourne. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Okay, Bruce. Nice talking to you. Nice and hello, Los Angeles. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Ladies and All gentlemen, right. that was Kathy Etchingham, former girlfriend, the long, long-term long girlfriend of Jimi Hendrix. Well, that does it for us here at LA Talk Radio and AM 1050, KCAA, NBC News Radio. Now, before we do go off the air, I would like to take this time to thank uh, my good friends over at eSpyMall.com. Again, for all your home surveillance needs, ladies and gentlemen, be sure to visit eSpyMall.com. Well, that does it for us here at the Bruce Montalvo Show. Be sure to tune in uh, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on KCAA 1050 and 12 noon Pacific Standard Time here on LA Talk Radio. Thank you for joining me, and remember that the freedom of the press is our right and our responsibility. Till next time.